Aloha, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on bridging space innovation opportunities, perspectives on Asia Pacific experiences. My name is Christy Covella, and I am the inaugural director of the newly established Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where I'm also an assistant professor in the Department of Asian Studies. I am so pleased that you can join us for today's webinar, which is an official side event of the 28th Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum. It's also the third such event that the University of Hawaii has organized in rotating leadership with the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies and Pacific Forum International. All of us are located in Honolulu, Hawaii. Recent years have witnessed a dramatic shift in the center of gravity as far as space innovation is concerned. Once mainly the province of state-related actors, innovation is now increasingly led by commercial space, often in close connection with civil and military space partners. While this is a process that is already underway in leading space nations, the progress and momentum in the Asia Pacific are mixed. Space industrial bases vary considerably across the region, and so too do the relationships among their civil, military, and commercial space sectors. Regulatory and institutional patterns diverge widely, and in some cases, they tend to lag developments in advanced space nations. So today, we want to explore different perspectives on these issues and exchange views on the current state of space innovation across the region, the evolving relationship between the public and private sectors in various countries, and what we can expect for the future of space innovation in the Asia Pacific as a whole. So we're really delighted to have an amazing lineup of speakers today. And to kick off the session, we are honored to have Brigadier General Jesse Morehouse, Deputy J-5 International Relations from U.S. Space Command. General Morehouse has a wealth of experience in space policy, artificial intelligence, and space operations, and it would take me a great deal of time to go through all of his various accomplishments, so I won't try to do them justice here. Instead, I will just say that we are really lucky to have him here today to share his expertise and to give us a perspective on how the US is thinking about these really complex dynamics in outer space. So without further ado, I will now hand the floor to General Morehouse. Well, good morning and thank you, Christy, for the introduction and good day to all of you from snowy Colorado. I'd like to thank the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for inviting me once again to be the keynote speaker at this event. It is always an honor to be invited to speak at events like this, where spacefaring nations can explore some of the complex challenges that confront us all. However, being invited back is truly a next level compliment, and I'm humbled to have this opportunity. I would also like to preemptively thank the distinguished panel who will be following me for what I'm sure will once again be the highlight of this event. Last year, I was told I could exit the event after my remarks were complete, and I'm glad to say that I did not. I see a few familiar names on the panel and look forward to once again improving my understanding of the issue at hand by way of the insightful dialogue that will follow my remarks. My task is to try and provide some jumping off points for future discussion, and I hope that in some small way my thoughts will help contribute to that goal. With that in mind, Let's talk about bridging space innovation opportunities. I would like to frame my remarks by briefly describing U.S. Space Command's interests related to this topic, and then sharing some insights from my dual roles as a Deputy Director for Plans, Policy, and Strategy with responsibilities for international security cooperation, but also influenced by the fact that I'm a member of the National Guard and as such a part-time soldier who also works part-time as a consultant in the space business sector. This gives me a rather unique perspective on this topic and one I'm excited to discuss. First, some framing. U.S. Space Command's mission is to conduct operations in, from, and to space to deter conflict and if necessary, defeat aggression, deliver space combat power for the joint and combined force, and defend U.S. vital interests with allies and partners. You will note that it is clear we recognize the command cannot perform its mission alone. Outside partners are mentioned twice in this mission statement, a key theme I will revisit in a few minutes. This mission is nested in support of our national security objectives, 
including the enduring objectives of ensuring the safety and prosperity of our citizens, allies, and partners. This includes fostering a space environment conducive to civil and commercial activities. Or simply put, U.S. Space Command does not perform military space operations for their own sake. We do them to ensure all responsible actors may explore the potential of space in a stable and secure environment. This is a big task. And as I've pointed out, we know we can't do it alone. Our partnerships span an enviable mix, including a large coalition of spacefaring nations, as well as civil and commercial entities. This broad network of partners has provided us with a large quantity of insights, which has in turn given us a jump start on the innovation process. For your reference, when I mention the innovation process, I'm envisioning a process similar to the design philosophy espoused by such organizations as the Stanford D School, in which innovation through a design approach is generally articulated as a two-phase process of ideation and implementation, both with an initial divergent brainstorming component, followed by a convergent refinement and scoping component. I'm a huge fan of this process and feel it is very applicable to our discussion. With this in mind, and our command's breadth of experience available, I would like to focus on two concepts that I think are illustrative of the kinds of innovation that national leaders representing space interests may benefit from exploring. The first concept is optimizing environments for innovation across military or civil relationships with industry. And the second concept is the power and challenges of international partnerships. First, how does one optimize an environment for innovation? It has been our experience that innovation environments are likely optimized when government and commercial partners stick to what they do best. This involves vision, risk, and cost. The visioning process drives requirement articulation and can be led by any entity with a need to execute a mission, whether they be military, civil, or commercial in nature. However, the visioning process benefits tremendously from a collaborative approach due to the framework of international law with national responsibilities, as well as evolving domain norms, technology maturation, and national policies, which influence the requirements considerations for entities across this continuum. Initial support and the identification of potential issues ensures fewer surprises further along in the development process. I think there's an excellent example from US Space Force's Space Systems Command that illustrates what success might look like, specifically their design sprint reviews. These events allow Space Systems Command to focus deeply on one specific challenge with many industry partners over a few intensive days that result in the government gaining an excellent understanding of what its requirements should be, while providing many industry partners with the foundational knowledge needed to begin developing innovative solutions based off a nuanced understanding of the evolving requirements. Next is risk. When fostering innovation, there is a strong historic precedent for governments assuming significant risk ownership to provide the necessary supports for commercial innovation. This delineation of responsibilities has historically proven extremely effective. and We see it manifest in the space industry today. As an example, if you look at a list of the top 20 nations from a count of the number of objects launched into space, you see all the nations you would expect to see, almost entirely comprised of G20 members, including from the Indo-Pacific, the US at number one, Russia at number two, China at number three, Japan at number five, India at number seven, South Korea at number 12, Australia, at number 14, and Indonesia at number 19. However, Luxembourg is number 10. And why is that? Luxembourg is a leader in creating a framework of national laws and complementary business climate 
that underwrites risk for small innovative companies in the space industry. This has resulted in Luxembourg attracting the interest of over 50 space companies across multiple space business sectors and two public research organizations. Clearly, underwriting risk allows a nation to punch well above its expected weight in the space sector. One thing worth noting here is that as innovative concepts are proven and become more commonplace, the need and appropriateness of government underwritten risk, especially for industry leaders, diminishes and should be scaled appropriately since organic risk ownership ensures long-term organizational responsibility. Finally, there is cost. If you want to innovate, there have to be industry incentives, but that has to be balanced with the responsible use of nat nat national resources. <laughs> Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Space Acquisition and Integration, Mr. Frank Cavelli, has recently published nine space acquisition tenets focused on increasing the speed of innovation with almost half of the tenets focused in some way on cost management. The idea of transparent guidance on cost considerations from senior leaders helps ensure transparency in this important and always shifting dynamic. However, one important consideration for developing such guidance should be candid discussions with industry on what sort of business structure and business case will ensure appropriate incentives. Like in all other realms, if leaders do not inspire or incentivize, no one will follow. I say this because while the US has a significant base of experience in government to commercial partnerships, our experience may not translate directly to other national situations and should be examined for appropriateness through national level dialogue prior to articulating incentive structures. The second lesson I wanted to discuss relates to innovation through mutually reliant international partnerships. I highlighted that US Space Command recognizes it is reliant on partnerships for mission success. This is a ubiquitous truth when it comes to high cost endeavors such as space security. However, there are probably some nuances to this that would benefit from deep national thinking. Clearly, partnerships create efficiencies. One noticeable terrestrial example is NATO with its 29 centers of excellence, including the new Space Center in France. The concept of data interoperability alone makes this a compelling innovative concept for space-related endeavors to consider. But is a spado, for lack of a better term, a concept that is really achievable? Clearly there are similarities, but there are also significant differences in the space security environment from that which in NATO was created. A space-related example of what such successful partnerships might look like from the civil space side is Artemis with its Six Nation partnership. Interestingly, part of Canada's contribution is robotic arm technology that has been a national niche area of expertise since the first space shuttle flights. Clearly, specialization can be useful in coalition endeavors. One of the challenges, especially in military endeavors, is the data heavy nature of space collaboration. This collaboration necessitates an important criteria for partnerships, network trust, something significantly different than national trust. I've heard it said that while the US military would not hesitate to go to war with our partners and allies at our side, the Department of Defense lacks trust in some of their networks, making the data collaboration required for coalition space innovation very difficult. Other challenges may be in play as well, and there may be real or perceived sovereignty issues which should be re-examined from a realism standpoint. These may manifest in strategic decisions related to niche technology investment, sovereign space launch capability, or whether a nation should own, lease, or cost share ownership of a specific space service, just to name a few. Clearly, there are challenges to creating complex space partnerships, 
but the rewards are such that these challenges are worth addressing to, prop to propel our nations forward at the leading edge of space innovation. In summary, as General Raymond, the first chief of space operations in the United States Space Force has quipped, space is hard. Space innovation is not only hard, but also complex. The myriad of interests, risks, and technical challenges make innovation seem daunting. However, the opportunities are clearly worth the effort, at least for all of us, or we wouldn't be here today. I believe that the best way ahead for any space actor will be unique to their own circumstances, but with some collaboration in the right venues and an informed national strategy, the opportunities are there for the taking if we work together towards bold goals none of us would ever reach alone. Thank you all for your time. It has been a pleasure sharing these thoughts with you. I look forward to seeing where the really smart folks in the room will take this discussion next. Thank you, General Morehouse, for those remarks. Uh, you've really given us a lot to think about and put some really interesting ideas and frames on the table that we can continue to discuss in the next part of today's event, which involves a really distinguished lineup of speakers for a panel discussion. So I would like to go ahead and at this time introduce the moderator of the next session, Dr. Alfred Olders. Dr. Olers is a professor at the Daniel K. Inouye Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies, and he was instrumental in the organization of today's webinar. So I really can't thank him enough for his collegiality and his expertise. Dr. Olers, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christy, and uh, a warm welcome uh, from Honolulu to all our international audience uh, around the world. Um, I'm, I'm really glad to, to say just taking a look at the registrations, uh, we, we are extremely gratified to see, of course, the number, but also the diversity and the geographical distribution of uh, everybody that has chosen to join us online. We thank you so much for your interest and we thank you for your uh, participation as well too. Thank you so much, Gerald Morehouse, for those uh, uh, keynote remarks. They, they, as Christy has said, they really are extremely helpful to us in. Uh, starting the foundation for the discussion. Um, my job is primarily to help uh, facilitate that conversation going forward. And uh, I'm privileged, really privileged to be able uh, to introduce this very distinguished panel that uh, we've uh, put together here today. Uh, we have four on the panel. We have firstly, Dr. Malcolm Davis, who is a senior analyst at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, ASPI in Australia. We have Dr. Namrata Goswami, who is an independent senior analyst based in the United States. We have Mr. Ron Lopez, president and managing director of Astroscale US. Um, and finally, we have Mr. Sam Wilson, who's a senior policy analyst at the Center for Space Policy and Strategy at the Aerospace Corporation. Thank you all for joining us today and lending us your time and contributing your your experience and expertise to this uh this topic that we are going to try to get more proficient at going forward and um ladies and gentlemen in the audience uh, for those of you who would like to contribute a comment or to ask a question of our panelists please make use of the question and answer box that we have uh, set up I see there is already one question in there that has been submitted. Uh, we will develop, I will keep an eye on that box and uh, try as much as possible to curate the questions coming in and at the appropriate moments to, to present them to the, um, to the panelists, all right? So please um, take a look at there down at the bottom Q&A and uh, click on that. And uh, you know, if you have questions or comments, please send them over making use of that facility. Now, without further ado, let's get into the discussion here because we've got quite a number of weighty issues to uh, to try to get to. I'm so glad to hear General Morehouse actually um, challenging us to some degree with his earlier comments around the issue of innovation and what innovation means uh, to him. And I think maybe for the benefit of many in our audience, uh, we all come to this issue of innovation in very different ways, depending on our backgrounds and 
the level of our knowledge uh, with respect to space and the innovation process. Maybe a good way to start is to get the perspective from the panelists on this issue. So for, for, for you panelists, uh, let me just pose a, a very simple question. Um, when, you, when you think or speak of space innovation, what do you have in mind? What are you thinking about? And um, I thought maybe uh, we'll start with Sam with this question. And Sam, if you could share some of your thoughts on what space innovation means to you. Over. Thank you so much. Um, and before I begin, I just want to thank you, Dr. Ehlers and, and, um, and Dr. Covella for, for inviting me. Um, it's an honor to be with, with such company, you know, following um, General Morehouse and then uh, with, I think, a really august group of, of thinkers and commercial leaders on for space um, and for the Asia Pacific. So it, it's a great question, right? Because I think there are multiple factors, as you mentioned, at play when it comes to space innovation. You have economic policy and technological changes, um, all contributing to this new uh, era in space um, that we're in. At the, at the policy level, you, you have governments, um, including the US government, embracing commercial developments rather than trying to restrain them, uh, which was the, pay, the, the, the case for a long time, including up until the kind of mid nineties. Um, at the economic level, we're seeing big investments of capital in exciting uh, private ventures for space. And then at the technological level, we're seeing really impressive developments, right? And including the miniaturization of spacecraft, um, and the emergence of uh, reusable rockets, right? To just name a two that, that have grabbed headlines. So, so all of these collectively have made the technical, uh, made the technical and financial burden for operating in space lower than it ever has been. And this has created the conditions for this global space operational environment that, that we're in. Um, Christy mentioned in the, in the past, you know, space was, limited to a few major government powers. And, and that has fundamentally changed. Uh, now there are over 70 countries that own or operate satellites in orbit. And you could also see this in the amount of activity in space. Um, the number over the, the last 10 years, the number of active satellites in orbit has more than quintupled. And based on current projections, that number should quintuple again over the next 10 years. And so I think this is all part of the causes and effects uh, of space innovation. And I think this is particularly germane to the Asia Pacific, where we're seeing lots of developments. Um, Christy mentioned in her comments kind of a spectrum, right, of, of maturity. And I just want to echo that. You know, on one end, you have Philippines establishing a national space agency. Uh, you have Singapore this year announcing um, big R&D investments uh, for, for, commercial, uh, for commercial space. You have this year in, in South Korea, South Korea launching its own domestically built rocket for the first time. And then you have Japan, um, which you know, their government has been, has been talking and releasing uh, information about pursuing a missile warning and tracking constellation, which is incredibly challenging, uh, evidenced by the fact that only two countries have space-based missile warning systems, the U.S. and Russia. So, so again, you're, you're just seeing really exciting developments ac across the spectrum of, of space maturity. Um, so I think this is just a really great time to be having this conversation. And I'll, I'll stop there. Great, great. Thank, thanks so much, Sam, for that, for that opener. And uh, let, let's transition to, to maybe a, a more sector-specific point of view. And, and Ron will help us there with his deep background in the space industry. Ron, what are you thinking when you think space innovation? Yeah, thanks. And again, I'd like to echo Sam's comment uh, at the outset. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, here to be with everybody today. Thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to participate in this fantastic forum. So what do I think about, what am I thinking when I hear space innovation? First of all, I'd like to say that it's a very exciting time to be in the space industry. There are a lot of things happening, a lot of investment going in, a lot of movement that we really haven't seen in, in a long time. Maybe 20 years ago, as I was exiting the Air Force, uh, there was a little bit of a bubble 
And uh, we're, we're, we're seeing that really on a new scale uh, today. General Morehouse spoke a little bit about innovation in his opening comments and described it as, a, as effectively a process. I think, however, that a lot of people think about how or what you apply to that process very narrowly. They tend to think of it in terms of that new cool widget or that cool new technology, right? We tend to think of innovation as a technological endeavor. But when I hear innovation, I think it's equally important to think about how it applies to economics and business models, how we do business, and also to policy, right? It's not just if a company wants to bring new capability to the marketplace, it's not enough just to come up with a new, uh, new cool technology. It's equally important that we think about how to address the market, how to bring that capability to market in a cost-effective way to ensure that it's at a price point that customers are willing to pay and that we as entrepreneurs can still uh, make money doing. And we also have to focus on the policy elements of this. And policy, I mean that writ large, policy, government policy, the regulatory environment, licensing, et cetera. These can be barriers to companies actually being profitable but the flip side is that they can also be enablers when done right. So when I hear space innovation, I think about new and innovate, new, interesting and more efficient way of doing things with respect to technology, economics and business models and policy. It has to be all of that. Great, thank you very much, Ron. And certainly a far more comprehensive uh, view of things than what maybe ordinary folks might be uh, taking a look at. We, we see all these images of the high tech stuff uh, launching into space and stuff like that. And we, we very often fall into that trap of thinking that's all there is to innovation. And we miss the entire backroom engineering that you pointed out that is so important. Thank you for that perspective. Now, in a way we go international now and, and maybe try to get a perspective of what innovation looks like from uh, other space partners out in the uh, Asia Pacific region. Uh, but I'll leave that really to our next speaker, our next panelist, to take it in the direction where she wants. Namrata, welcome. And please, Namrata, I, I hear that you might be heading off to an international conference soon. So what sort of uh, perspectives are you thinking that you might come in touch with uh, while you're away from us? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, first of all, thank you for having me again. It's a great honor and to be with such a great panel and to have such a great keynote speaker. Thank you for setting the frame. So I think when I think of space innovation, I think of space innovation as a policy, a technology, a regulatory framework that is introduced that did not exist before into the space environment. And that changes the game of how you actually use a technology look at a particular policy or utilize a regulatory framework. So for example, if I think about space technology, one of the innovating and actually game-changing technology is reusability, right? So when you had reusable rockets, it actually had such a spinover effect that now China has declared that it wants a reusable rocket. India just came out with a space policy focusing on reusability. Japan is talking about it. So that's what it is. Innovation is a new way, a new technology, a new regulatory framework that changes the game. And having looked at that from a policy perspective, so one of the policy I think in the Asia Pacific that is having a deep impact is for example, the China-Russia Memorandum of Understanding to uh, establish a research base on the moon by 2036. And that has a spillover effect into how nations, including uh, Japan, India, are viewing the moon. And so Japan comes up now with a policy that is also innovative, that talks about collaborating with its uh, private company called iSpace to establish a base on the moon, or they call it settlement on the moon by 2040. Now, in terms of uh, international regulation, if you think about innovation, how I think about innovation is I see the Outer Space Treaty as an innovation in 1967 that did not exist before, but, but that actually set the frame for everything else that followed, right? So in terms of regulator, regulations that came after that, including how states actually started thinking, thinking about regulation. 
Now, in terms of commercial, private enterprise and organizational change, I think in the Asia Pacific, there is something that is happening that is astounding. So for example, India just uh, in 2019, completely changed the way it does space and started establishing a concept called New Space India Limited that goes away from state focused space uh, agencies and programs to becoming more about the commercial sector. And in fact, this year, India just launched its first uh, privately built rocket into space, which is called the Vikram rocket by Skyroot Aerospace. For Japan, uh, if you look at its basic uh, plan and space policy, its fourth basic plan, one of the interesting innovation that Japan has brought about into the Asia Pacific is to highlight this critical innovative concept they call commercialization of spaceports and turning Japan into a hub for space business. Now that is innovative because till then you had spaceports that were funded by the state, maintained by the state, and so basically using taxpayer money. But now they are thinking about commercializing it. And this has had a spillover effect that now China wants to commercialize its spaceports and so does India. So I'll end by saying that when I think about innovation, you introduce a policy concept, a technology or a regulatory framework that changes the game. That's what innovation to me sounds like. Mm, thank you very much, Namratara. You know, I was only half kidding about, you know, the, the, what I, I was asking, but you really have hit the nail on the head there by, by raising the bar on the discussion and introducing this international dimension to it as well, too. Thank you so much for that. And last but not least, let's let's get a look from Australia and, and where Malcolm is and you know, Malcolm, what what where does it what does it look like for you, um, you know, in Australia? Well, thanks, Al, and it's great to be back uh, at this event. Uh, the last year I did it, I was in the midst of another space conference, so I had to find a room to to connect that was reasonably quiet. This time, it's it's a lot easier in my office at Aspie. Um, look, uh, I think uh, echoing what Namrata has said. Um, Innovation is all about uh, doing something new in a radically different way that opens up new opportunities to make progress. Um, I think you can uh, develop a technology in an evolutionary sense, or you develop a policy uh, that essentially allows you to achieve a goal. But if you then just go back to that and you try to do the same thing over and over again, that's not really innovation. Innovation is when you say, uh, look, we want to try something new. We want to try something disruptive. Uh, whether it's in situ resource utilization on the moon or space-based solar power or space-based manufacturing or using uh, reusable rocket technology, it's fundamentally trying something new and breaking away from the old mode and uh, and essentially having the courage to do that, taking the risks that it could fail. Uh, if you look at SpaceX, you know that they went through so many failures in terms of rockets blowing up on the pad and so forth before they finally perfected the Falcon 9. And now they're going through the same process with the Starship Super Heavy. So innovation is about taking risks. It's about accepting failure, learning from failure, rather than trying to avoid failure uh, and recognizing that sometimes the technology can't be at the highest technological re readiness level, can't be at TRL 9, for example, if you want to make progress. And I think when you look at what's happening in Australia, uh, we've gone from a country that essentially was quite content uh, from essentially the end of the uh, 1960s through to, uh, say, about 2015, was quite content just to rely on others to provide space capabilities for us. We've gone from that passive dependency uh, through to becoming an active participant in space in terms of actually building satellites, building launch vehicles, uh, positioning ourselves to launch uh, Australian and other, uh, other country satellites on Australian launch vehicles from Australian launch sites. Uh, and so that to me is, is, is a, an approach of, of innovation that is new, but we have to keep on going and we have to be prepared to take risks. Uh, and so you know, our support for uh, the Artemis project uh, in terms of the Moon to Mars initiative that's being run by the Australian Space Agency uh, leads us down that path where we're going to be forcing ourselves to do new things and take risks. And I think that's that's really critical. So all the sort of technologies that have been mentioned already by my other panelists, I think, are highly relevant. Uh, we'll go down the path of reusable rockets. We'll go down the we're, we're already going down the path of small satellite technologies, uh, space manufacturing, on orbit uh, refueling and repair, 
uh, is something that we're clearly going to get into. It's about identifying those new focal points or focal paths in the next generation of space capabilities and embracing them rather than being risk averse. And I think that's the key point. If you want to innovate, you can't be risk averse. You've got to embrace the risk, embrace the, the risk that things go wrong, but you learn from the failures and you make fast progress. Great, thank you very much, Malcolm. Um, we have uh, one question on this issue of innovation uh, from our audience, and um, I'll I'll, um, I'll like to kind of, I'll like to direct this this question um, to uh, Namrata and to Ron uh, because I think that the both of you will be able to give us um, some some diversity and perspective on this. Uh, Namrata, from your point of view of uh, you know frameworks for regulation and so forth. But Ron, from a commercial perspective, how you perceive regulation? And, and the question is this, it comes from Mr. Ma, it comes from uh, Bangladesh um, for non-trial attribution purposes. I won't read out the name of the uh, person that submitted it, but it's basically, basically along these lines. Uh, do you see a need for international, for an international organization at the United Nations, such as the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO, that will uh, provide a robust, safe, and secure regulatory framework to govern uh, innovation. And Namrata, for you first, and then uh, from, from your perspective, Ron. Yeah, so that's a very interesting strategic question, right? So if you think about the concept of innovation, as Malcolm was saying, innovation calls for risk taking. Innovation takes for a regulatory framework that is flexible, and open. And I can tell you an example of India where regulation was very strict in terms of space capability and development and lots of bureaucratic process that there was a, actually a revolution that was brought about by the new space companies that actually forced the Indian government to become more open and open up its space sector. So to answer the question about international uh, you know, regulation in terms of innovation, I think if you think about it at the level of the United Nations, so what does the United Nations do when it comes to space? So basically the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is the key framework. So it basically does three very critical things. One, it tells you that space is uh, space should be accessible to all. Two, it tells you that space, you cannot have national appropriation of territory. And three, space is for peaceful purposes. So that's the larger general framework. And then you have additional treaties that talks about rescue liability and, uh, and, and basically you also have the moon treaty that's not signed by the space faring nations that talk about how the moon needs to be, uh, you know, if you have uh, access to resources, how it has to be shared. But as I said, that's only signed by 18 nations. So at the UN level, I do not see, and my panelists might disagree with me there, I really do not see how the United Nations can regulate innovation itself happening within countries, right? So if SpaceX wants to invest in Starship and use Starship to then go to Mars, I don't think uh, United Nations will have a role in ensuring how that regulation happens. Where it might have a role is how that innovation then affects how a particular state might behave or how the private entity that is registered to a particular state can be held responsible if something goes wrong, right? So it's, it's a very strategic question, but I don't think the United Nations has a direct role in regulating innovation in terms of space technology. I agree with uh, you, Namrata, 100%, not just in terms of regulating innovation, but just regulating space, period, writ large, right? Uh, so I'd like to say at the outset that a lot of people think that people in business absolutely uh, detest any kind of regulation across the board, right? And that's just simply not the case. A good regulatory environment can actually be an enabler, right? As industry, you have insurance of what agency you have to go to to acquire a certain license or who, where you need to go to get mission authorization, uh, et cetera. And also to ensure that all of the players, whether they're commercial or otherwise, are being good stewards of the resources that we have in space because the environment in space is really just an extension of the, of the environment that we here have here uh, on, on Earth. 
uh, the former uh, head in the U.S. of the Office of Space Commerce at the Department of Commerce, Kevin O'Connell, and his predecessor uh, now also uh, have spoken um, a lot about a, regula a permissive regulatory environment. And I think that's where we need to go. And I think that needs to happen first and foremost at the national level and at the international level, really focus on coordination and collaboration among like-minded nations. We have a lot of nations out there that won't necessarily want to play along with the UN if they come out with certain policy or regulatory statements. UN COPUS, uh, and I always forget the acronym because it's quite long, the uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, I believe. Um, they uh, spent many, many, many years coming up with a set of uh, uh, guidelines. They wanted something a little bit more forceful, but in the end came up with guidelines which are good, but effectively nothing more than just guidelines. And I think that that really goes to the, the, the challenges of having international bodies such as the UN um, do uh, policy and regulation in a meaningful way. So I think that it really, the focus really needs to be at the nation state level and have like-minded nations, Europe, uh, the US, Japan, Korea, other allies in, in, um, in the Asia Pac region and work and collaborate to make sure that to the degree that's possible, there's consistency among those regulatory frameworks. Great, Th thank you uh, both to Namrata and to, uh, and to Ron for uh, your perspectives on that. We have time to take one more question and I'm gonna take the liberty as moderator in uh, combining two questions that came through on basically the same sort of theme here. And uh, this is partly something, a lesson learned from maybe the recent uh, COVID pandemic that has afflicted all of us where we, we saw to some degree uh, the unwelcome appearance of uh, COVID nationalism, vaccine nationalism, and those sorts of aspects here. And, and Ron, you kind of maybe triggered this because in your comments about like-minded nations uh, working together, when we're taking a look at space innovation, is, is there a risk of, uh, of space nationalism intruding into this question? And, uh, you know, with this, um, impede international collaborative efforts going forward. I'll put this to Ron, and uh, but then maybe Malcolm, you, you would like to jump in and, and answer, provide your perspective as well too. Over to you both. Yeah, so I'll keep my comments brief to, because I'm interested to hear the perspectives of my colleagues here, but uh, I, I think the short answer is yes, absolutely yes. Uh, nation states are always going to enact um, policies and pursue programs in space that are aligned with broader national strategic objectives, right? It's a lot of, um, um, uh, in terms of the programs that nation states fund, um, a lot of taxpayer dollars that have to be spent in, in a responsible way. And so um, that, that you have policies or pursuit of programs that are aligned with broader national strategic objectives uh, is both necessary and just a, a matter of, of fact. Uh, the problem, that's not a problem. The problem comes in when you have the pursuit of certain national goals that run counter to established uh, norms of behavior and uh, treaties that already are in existence, whether or not, as Lamrata pointed out, nation states have signed up to them, right? So when you take a national policy objective and you're funding it and you're collaborating with other like-minded nations, such as under the Artemis Accord, uh, that's great. We can achieve things together that you can't achieve alone. And there's a little bit of national pride in what every country is doing. And I think that's a positive thing. It's when you do things that run counter to that, that create um, a space environment that is less safe than, uh, or you are pursuing national objectives at the exclusion of what other nations are doing in space. That's when it becomes a problem. Yeah, I would I would add to that. I mean, I think space has been militarized from the be very beginning. Uh, it's not a peaceful sanctuary that sits serene and untouched by geopolitical competition below. Uh, you know, you're seeing space used for military purposes right across the spectrum of, of military tasks and missions, and it's more vital than ever 
uh, in terms of how it supports and enables joint and integrated operations in the modern battle space. And that's only going to increase, particularly as we become more dependent on a, a wider array of space technologies, including small satellite mega constellations to support internet of things and uh, connectivity. We're already seeing, for example, Starlink supporting the Ukrainian military uh, in its fight against the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. So um, where does this where does this go? I think that uh, even though there will be obviously benefits in terms of commercial space activity, opening up the space frontier for space resource utilization and exploration, you're going to have the national competition occurring as well. Uh, and that's going to occur right across the board from low Earth orbit all the way out to cislunar space. Um, and so I think that uh, that's just the reality. We just have to accept that. We, as 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 wish, uh, as well-meaning and as as we might wish, um, the legal and the diplomatic efforts to try and regulate and constrain space weaponization ultimately won't work if uh, only a certain portion of countries actually sign up to it. If our opponents, if our adversaries don't sign up to it, and it's important to note that recent attempts to get China and Russia to sign up to a voluntary ban on testing of kinetic kill direct descent ASATs has failed, uh, then they're going to go ahead. Uh, and you are going to see, I think, nationalization leading to space weaponization. And that's just the reality. So how do we respond to that? I think we try our best in terms of uh, diplomatic and legal and regulatory approaches to try and constrain or narrow the opportunities for weaponization. But we also back it up. Uh, with effective deterrence by denial and deterrence through resilience, uh, through space control, to actually drive up the cost of utilising space weapons to the point whereby it's not in the interests of those states to actually use those weapons, uh, either because they're not effective, because we have deterrence by denial or deterrence by uh, resilience, and we can also impose cost on them through political and economic means, and at that point, I think you start to get to the point whereby maybe we, we could sit down with the Chinese and the Russians and say, look, space weapons are not achieving anything for you. So let's actually talk about some confidence and security building measures. Let's, let's talk about constraints. That's what we did with nuclear weapons uh, during the Cold War, where we, we sat down with the Soviets and say, yeah, it's not in anyone's interest to have an uncontrolled uh, nuclear arms race. So let's actually pose some constraints and some limits. Salt one, salt two didn't work. A start, new start and so on. So that's the process I think we need to go uh, rather than you know, hoping for the best when it comes to you know, the legal approach and the regulatory approach that somehow everyone will play by the rules. I don't think they will. Great, thank you very much, Malcolm. And, and thank you, Ron, as well too, for your, for your comments there on that question. Uh, in the interest of time, we do have to move on. And, and I, I'd like to return to um, another sort of theme that is quite important in the discussion about space innovation. Um, and it was, a, it was something that Christy uh, mentioned in her opening remarks. And, and General Mohaus as well, too, hinted at this in this discussion of um, how Spacecom is interacting with uh, various partners to include the commercial sector. And, and this comes to the, the, the issue of how there is a there's a there's an impression uh, held by many now that uh, at least in the leading space nations of the world, the the center of gravity in space innovation has shifted across to the commercial sector as opposed to the state led se sector. And I I I I think while fair comment for the advanced space uh, nations, it's uh, maybe a much more mixed picture when we take a look at the Asia Pacific. I want to get the panel's views on this. Uh, if we're looking at the Asia Pacific, is, is it fair to say that such a process is underway as well? And if it is underway, a shift towards the commercial sector, you know, where is it happening? And uh, why or why not in the case of those nations where it's, uh, it's not uh, uh, getting uh, any traction? So, um, you know, we've got a, a, a representative from the commercial sector here in the shape of Ron. And I, I thought, Ron, I'll, I'll throw this question to you in terms of how you see things happening in the Asia Pacific region, over. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it is a trend that is absolutely happening in the US and Europe. And, and I believe in, in Asia Pac as well. I mean, I'm a perfect example of that. I head up a company here in the US called Astroscale US. We are a subsidiary of Astroscale Holdings, which is a Japanese company. 
right? We were founded in Japan nine years ago, and we now have subsidiaries in the US, in the UK, as well as in Israel. Uh, Namrata mentioned iSpace, another company which uh, stood up to do uh, uh, lunar-related robotics. And uh, they have offices here in the US and in Luxembourg as well. Uh, there is another company in Japan, Kitai, that is doing space robotics. And they have also, uh, they're in the process of setting up shop here in the US. And I can name a few more. A few more. Of course, I'm more familiar with the Japanese examples that Sam mentioned in his comments earlier. There's a lot of good work uh, going on in Korea, a lot of good work and technology building going on in Singapore and other places. So why and why not? And why in these places? I think that has to do with the amount of capital, investment capital available in these different markets to fund uh, entrepreneurs who want to start new companies. And that, the amount of capital available in the market is in turn affected by the size of the market itself and the return on investment and the ability of companies to pursue business in other countries, which of course is hindered, as Malcolm mentioned in his answer to the previous question by national objectives. Um, you also have the regulatory environment that we've spoken a lot about already. And also it depends on government and they're willing to take on uh, uh, risk. I think underwriting risk was the uh, term that General Morehouse used in his opening comments. It, the, all of those things impact the amount of capital available in the market, which the, uh, of course in the larger markets, you have more capital available, smaller carpets, less. Uh, and there, that sort of impacts uh, how industry, the rate at which industry is growing throughout the region. But it is a trend that I think is gonna continue. Great, thanks very much, Ron. And uh, I'd like to invite Namrata to uh, follow next and, and provide some perspective on this. Over to you, Namrata. Yeah, sure, thank you, Al. Actually, that's a, that's a great way to actually understand how uh, Asia Pacific nations are, are actually aspiring to develop their uh, commercial sector as well. And I think uh, it's happening because one way you can see that it's happening is organizational change, right? So usually when you want to understand it from an empirical level, you have to look into what kind of policy documents that they have put out that support the commercialization of space and develop their own commercial space industry. So one example is of course, the major spacefaring nation in Asia, China. So China put out a document in 2014 called Document 60, and it's available for on the internet and translated into English. And over there, the basic premise of that particular document that was uh, published by the State Council of the People's Republic of China, the idea was that China needs to develop its commercial space industry for three very important factors, innovation that we are talking about, but more technological innovation. Second, to develop the market for the future. And three, to increase China's contribution to the uh, external commercial market including concepts like space tourism, right? And so since then, uh, and now, now how do you actually then prove that how has this document led to actual change, right? So then you see if it has led to space startups, has it led to technological demonstration and that all that has happened in China. So you have new companies like the Chinese iSpace, you have land space, you have link space, galaxy space that's building concepts like satellite internet, which is going to be a game changer in Asia, given the fact that several areas do not have connection to fiber internet. Uh, they already have launched rockets to orbit. So that's demonstration for you. The other spacefaring nation of India also, as I said before, have started changing its organizational structure and in fact have established two different in interesting organizations. One is the New Space India Limited, that is completely devoted to developing India's commercial space sector, but also in space that actually helps in collaboration and funding. Now, this is the other critical dimension. Nations in Asia are starting to fund and develop the base for their commercial space sector. So giving taxpayer money so that space startups can actually have a prop to develop. SpaceX would not have made it without NASA contracts. And so that's a very similar trajectory that countries in Asia are following. Now, we've talked a lot about Japan. So let me give you examples from Indonesia, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Pakistan. They are also starting to think about space innovation, as well as developing not just their commercial space sector, but also taking advantage of their location in the Asia Pacific. Indonesia is a great example. So Indonesia is one of the uh, oldest actually space focused country in Asia, 
with the longest surviving space agency. And so recently, Indonesia put out a statement under President Widodo that said that Indonesia is going to use its closeness to the equator to then develop their commercial space industry and uh, also develop concepts like their own rockets uh, in the next 20 years. They have already started funding that through commercial partnerships and also to see if they can actually collaborate outside of Indonesia. For example, uh, the president of Indonesia called up uh, Elon Musk of SpaceX and requested him to come to Indonesia to help fund a spaceport, right? So you can see these changes happening beyond just the major spacefaring nations of China, India, and Japan with independent launch systems to those countries that actually are starting to also showcase through their programs, their projects, their interest in commercialization of space. Great, thank you so much, Namrata, especially for for listing us, uh, listing out for us, uh, you know, a wider range of uh, examples of this happening. I'd like to turn now to to Malcolm. Malcolm, would you like like to add something from uh, Australia? Well, um, I think uh, Australia's example is uh, we have completely skipped the step in the process of having a government-run space agency that builds the rockets. Uh, recruits the astronauts, trains the astronauts, flies the spacecraft. We don't do that. Um, our space agency's role is to support the growth of commercial space in Australia, uh, to grow that, that sector, uh, to increase the number of jobs, to increase the, the prosperity of that sector. Obviously, they, they uh, develop space policy, but they do so in collaboration with the commercial sector and also with the Department of Defence. And they also engage internationally with uh, fellow space agencies. So, you know, unlike NASA or the European Space Agency or JAXA or any of the others, we've kind of skipped that step of having a national space agency that that, that starts by doing space exploration. We don't do that. Uh, we have the commercial space sector that, that really takes us forward. And I think that's a really important step because it fast tracks our ability to get into the innovation cycle to actually uh, make faster progress, to uh, contribute more directly to national space capabilities, be they for defense and national security or for commercial and civil activities, and also to engage with international partners. So you have, for example, Southern Space, uh, sorry, Southern Launch, um, which is operating the Whalers Way spaceport near Port Lincoln in South Australia that is planning to launch uh, uh, launch vehicles that are being built by a Taiwanese company operating in Australia called AT Space. Uh, you know, I think that Australia seems to have recognised and learned from history in the sense that there's no need to go down that state-run space program route. You can just go straight to a commercial space sector and actually gain second mover advantage from that process. And I think that's where we're headed in the future. I don't see us ever going down the path of of essentially relying on the state to do everything. And, and I don't think the, uh, the space sector is, is set up that way here in Australia. Great, thank you so much, Malcolm. And Sam, I've saved you to last time because I know you've just, you've just gone on this mega tour through the region. So come, come tell, give us a few travel stories about what you've seen. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'll, I'll try to add, um, I, was in, I was in Seoul uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, I work closely with our international partnerships team, and and we're working on a, um, we're working a profile on on South Korea and in Singapore. The the Seoul trip was was for a conference, but but I, you know I think more broadly that there is a lot of stress, and you, and you're seeing this in the Asia Pacific, and you're hearing this through all these examples, right? There's a lot of stress on this traditional model of space development, right? The traditional model is you know governments uh government driven investment um and now i think you're seeing you know these models of governments thinking how can we attract commercial companies and i was really glad that, that general morehouse brought up luxembourg because that that they are a perfect example of how to attract uh commercial space industry to your country um christy bradford actually a couple of years ago had a really good paper on that um and then there's a the second question of how to build up your domestic industry and i think that that touches on some of the things that that Malcolm and Namrata brought up of, of, you know, thinking about how to provide subsidies, you know, what are the right uh, incentive structures? And then, you know, just to meet some government needs, you know, get the best bang for your buck by buying commercial, right? Like where you can, 
Like maybe you don't need to develop this industry, right? Maybe in some cases you can just you can just buy something that exists, and that's a great way uh, for the government to be able to to achieve to to exploit some of the advantages of space capabilities without actually having to develop it or, or uh, stimulating a, a private venture to develop it, right? Um, so you know, with, with Singapore, um, they are you know I mentioned that they're doing a lot of R and D directly to pr uh, promising commercial companies. They're partnering with domestic companies and foreign companies, um, and I think that's really interesting. They're also just procuring available imagery, right? Which again is a lot, a lot cheaper than you know building up your own electro optical uh, satellite constellation. Uh, you know, South Korea, what something that they're doing, and there's just so much focus. You can't talk to us about South Korea space without talking about commercial. So much focus on trying to to convert transfer technology from CARI, from from their development, from their government development to industry. Um, and all the policies they've released over the last couple of years um, have been a focus on trying to encourage and stimulate uh, private private sector development. So, so I just think there's there's going to be a lot more attention on these alternative models rather than the sort of traditional model that that we that you know a lot of the the, the wealthy nations started with, right? I mean, now yes, U.S. is starting to think about how to exploit commercial, but but for a long time it was this, just this traditional model. Um, and certainly there's going to be, you know, the hybrid is probably going to be what, what you want. You want a little bit of, of all these things. But I, I think, you know, countries are now trying to be more strategic um, about what that combination looks like because you have, you know, such promising examples in the commercial world to draw from. Thank you, Sam. And Sam, don't go away because we have a question from the audience here that I think maybe you could start off providing an answer to. Uh, and it, it comes from Mongolia. Uh, you were in South Korea. Mongolia is just a short plane ride away. Um, but it's uh, it's an interesting question because the, the question draws attention to the really intensifying competition happening when it comes to space, broadly speaking, but space innovation as well, too. And, and if you're a much smaller nation, we've spoken about Luxembourg, thanks to uh, you know General Morehouse has mentioned, but for a country like Mongolia, if we were to situate this in a much more specific sort of way, how do you balance out the equities involved in this competition between the largest space powers there? How do you navigate between you know, what can be a pretty precarious sort of balance going forward over there? Any advice? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, know, you really wanna think about how can we, how can we try to use the amount of funding we have um, in in the most kind of imaginative ways to get more money from space? And and you know I, I think really small nations need to think about this. I think the U.S. needs to think more about this, right? And it's not just it's not just commercial. It's also just with other countries, right? By doing stuff more um, collaboratively um, or, or trying to use what's available. You can just you can just extract a lot more value from space. Next year, um, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. is putting national security payloads on a Norwegian satellite, and this will be this will save the United States. This will save collectively nine hundred million dollars by putting an active national security payload on a foreign satellite. The next year, um, they're gonna the U.S. is gonna do this. Uh, with Japanese positioning navigation timing satellites, they're the QZSS satellites, and, and that's going to be a foreign satellite and a foreign launcher. What's amazing to me is that we haven't done this before, right? Like this saves so much money. There's so many, there's so much value here. Um, and, and so whether it's with foreign countries or whether it's other companies or using what exists or using what's free, Right, like th this is the way to try to to do as much as you can in space. So I, I think that, that 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 piece of advice exists for Mongolia. It also exists for for the United States. Right. Thank you very much, Sam and Malcolm. You're looking very pensive, and you're thinking deeply about this question. I could see. So you know, from a from a point of view of Australia, interacting particularly with uh, many smaller nations out there in the space game, uh, what, what words of advice might you give? Look, I, I think the advice is, you know, sort of find a, a friend that's uh, that's a rising space baron. Um, 
yes, I'm uh, unashamedly promoting Australian space here. Um, find a friend that is an, a, a rising space power and work with them. You know, one of the things that we've talked about, for example, with the Southwest Pacific, is how can these small Pacific Island states get space capabilities to help them deal with such challenges such as climate change or help them to do national development. And, you know, we're developing small satellite technologies, we're developing sovereign launch. Uh, there's an opportunity for them to work with us to develop capabilities for them and bring their people into our space sector so that they're developing expertise and skills that they can then go back and help develop their own country's space sector, even if it's the ground segment. But you know, we can provide that space segment to them in the same way, for example, that the United States su supplied the space segment to us in the last few decades uh, because we weren't in a position to develop it ourselves. Now we're a space power, we're developing our own sovereign capabilities. We can do the same thing uh, for these smaller actors. So I, I do think it's about you know, sort of picking your friends wisely, uh, recognizing that, you know, Sometimes you don't want to necessarily throw in with uh, a major actor like China that, that has all sorts of strings attached to their um, uh, space Silk Road type concepts. Uh, so, you know, sort of I think that that's important is working with other countries of like minded interests uh, and essentially developing space capabilities with them. And most importantly, not just being a passive receiver, but actually becoming involved in the process of developing space understanding space. Yeah, Great, Malcolm, if I may quickly, uh, because I think this Mongolian example is really interesting because a few years back I was in a, I was listening into a space advisory council meeting. And what was fascinating was that there was this group, uh, a commercial group in Mongolia called Mars V that is building a tourist experience of how it would be to live in Mars by taking the uh, desert of Mongolia, right? And what is fascinating is that they actually then started collaborating with the Mars Society, including Dr. Robert Zubrin, who's written the book, The Case for Mars, excellent book. I would recommend it to anyone. And so he, Zubrin then went there and what he discovered was that this were not just a few, uh, you know, young Mongolians. They actually had membership from cabinet members, bank presidents, so the huge, the whole country was behind this particular space project, right? And so, and then they went on to have a great musical number called the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order by The Who. So what I'm saying is that what you see here is fascinating. Uh, the Who is a Mongolian heavy metal group. If you've not heard them, you should. And so I think my point is that what you see here in this country is that you have a small group that gives the idea to the society that space can be a way for. And so if you look at the mission of the group, it's fascinating. They talk about the renewable space economy, contribution of Mongolia to utilize its own uh, location, geography to then engage with that space economy and to build tourist uh, experiences. And then finally to collaborate with like-minded actors across the world, right? And so that's what I would advise to small nations that you should take advantage of your culture, your young, uh, innovative professionals who actually are global in mind. And you can even use your music to connect to the world, which the US does very well through its popular culture, right? Star Wars, Star Trek, huge influence on the world. So I think that's the advice I would give. I, I was influenced. So you can imagine what that could do to billion or millions like me, right? Who can then reach out to them. Okay, I'm not a metal fan, but please do send me the details and I'll check them out. Oh, that is wonderful. You know, <laughs> I, I, I never dreamt I'll be on a panel as innovative as this one, but this really takes a, takes the cake. Uh, Namrata, and I, could, I knew I could always count on you to pull in something that is really different and out of the box. So thank you for that intro to uh, a Mongolian uh, heavy metal band. But uh, hey, you know what? Some of these comments here actually signaled uh, another sort of direction that I thought would be useful to explore for our for our audience because um, we are, we're essentially talking about um, constraints here to some degree, but then also, uh, you know, opportunities. And I thought that it might be really helpful if, if we got the perspective of panelists on what you see to be some of the main inhibitors or enablers of space innovation in the Asia Pacific. And, uh, you know, if we're looking at places like Japan or India or, or Mongolia as well too, you know, 
what, what, what's that magic combination of structural relationships, incentives, policy or regulatory frameworks that, that actually could help foster uh, a kind of an, an innovative sort of culture or climate and, and help uh, innovation move forward. And I, I thought Namrata, you know, because you, you've inspired me with your mention of heavy metal and stuff like that, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push this in, in your direction first, of, uh, Namrata. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So I think uh, if I think about what inhibits innovation in space in general, as well as international partnerships or in the Asia Pacific, the one thing that comes to mind is what Ron answered, which is the nationalistic aspect of space as well. So if you think about how the space programs are conceptualized, including how the commercial sector has been activated, there's a lot of nationalism and also by that a, a connection of space to national security. And because space is so much connected to national security, sometimes that could lead to inhibition in terms of uh, that magic when you're talking about, right? In terms of building that space innovative structure. And actually companies uh, sometimes do get into trouble because sometimes space technology is such technology that is so much connected to national security that international collaborations can be highly regulated, right? Just think of the United States International Traffic and Arms Regulation. I mean, ITAR, if you talk to my colleague uh, with whom I teach at uh, Arizona State University, Kevin O'Connell, uh, he would tell you that American companies have got into trouble for not really understanding the implication of ITAR. And space startups sometimes do not have that lawyer capability or can employ lawyers that can tell them what the implications are. So in the Asia Pacific, I think that is one of the inhibitors in terms of when I think about space innovation, because it's so much connected to national security that that could lead to dampening of that commercial spirit. And so example is India. India took so long to push for space and space innovation because it was seen as a very niche technology. And there were concerns that if you open it up to the new space companies, this kind of technology might get proliferated without consent, right? And so the second inhibitor, I think, despite the fact that there is a huge push for this, is national level regulation that actually meets your international obligation. Almost all nations in the Asia Pacific are, uh, they have signed the Outer Space Treaty, so they are treaty obligated. And if you see the articles, it says that nation states are responsible for the behavior of commercial actors in space. Uh, which is also the liability convention. And so the absence of very clear national level regulation can create inhibitions as well. So India does not have a national level regulation. China has not come up with a national level, re level regulation. And so recently I was very impressed. Now that's the magic. I was very impressed with Japan because Japan is, I think, the first Asia Pacific nation to come up with a clear level national regulation guideline for how do you give ownership in regard to space resource utilization. So in December, they came out with a space regulation that clearly established lines of authority. The final license is given by the prime minister of Japan. And the first company to actually get that license is iSpace. And iSpace, in case they're able to extract resources on the moon, is going to sell it to NASA. So that's the proof of concept, right? So that's the uh, second, uh, I think, uh, inhibitor I see that can once uh, once basically addressed could lead to the magic that we are talking about. And finally, I think uh, one of the biggest issue in countries of the Asia Pacific is funding, right? So if you think about commercial space sector, Indonesia is an example, several of my colleagues who are very excited and want to establish space startups then cannot get the funding for it, right? Because first of all, the the major funder would be the state and the level of funding that exists in the U.S. through venture capitalism or seed funding does not exist in some of these countries for space. Might exist for something else, but for space, it is still not there. So that could also create uh, those kind of uh, hurdles to the space economy taking off. Having said that, there is a push for such a sector to be developed. I think I would give it another five, six years for it to mature to the level where the US and other nations are. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Namaratra. And I'll, I'll turn to Malcolm next. Malcolm? Yeah, allow, allow me to echo um, Namaratra. ITAR 
it's the, it's the big uh, barrier to everything. And I don't think it's a case of getting rid of ITAR because clearly there needs to be some sort of regulation on uh, accessing sensitive US technology. It's a case of, of dealing with the overwhelming bureaucracy uh, and the bureaucratic process that is associated with putting in requests through ITAR to get access to informational technology. It's just so, so cumbersome and, and, and overwhelming. So I think that what the US could do is actually sit down and look at its own, get its own house in order in terms of ITAR and actually update those rules and regulations and the process to make it easier for key partners and allies to work with it we have the same problem. Uh, it's not just you know, sort of small states. It's about key US analysts and partners that can't access critical US technologies for our own national security that then helps the United States out. So uh, this is this is an issue that, that I think is well past time that needs to be addressed in terms of, of resolving ITAR. Uh, I think the second point uh, that, that certainly we're facing, and I'm sure that other states will face in the region in terms of an inhibitor, is uh, risk aversion in terms of failure. You know, people have this perception that space is really expensive. They think in Apollo mindset, you know, it's hundreds of billions of dollars to do space. In actual fact, the cost of space is going down so much that you know, Elon Musk is talking $10 million per launch for a Starship Super Heavy at some point. Um, but there is this perception that space is risky and it's expensive. And so over-regulation then kind of stifles progress and it uh, makes it almost impossible for small to medium enterprises to actually uh, be successful. We have that problem here in terms of um, defense technology uh, uh, funds and uh, in uh, innovation hubs and so forth, where the actual governmental approval process to get funding for small to medium enterprises is, is so overwhelmingly difficult to, to work through that small to medium enterprises generally don't get a look in. And so what happens is that governments tend to automatically turn to overseas primes, the big aerospace companies for major contracts, rather than giving small to medium enterprises the chance to actually uh, achieve things and, and, and deliver government contracts. So I think that, they need, that we ourselves uh, here in Australia, and I'm sure the same is true for uh, for other countries, need to actually look at how we deal with uh, areas such as space in terms of providing incentives and opportunities for small to medium enterprises to actually compete effectively for government contracts to deliver capabilities. Uh, and I think that if that were done alongside uh, reducing the bureaucratic uh, nightmare that is ITAR, uh, then I think that we could achieve so much more in terms of com com uh, countries working with the United States to deliver a, a range of space capabilities that would then reduce the risk aversion of governments and we suddenly start to achieve a lot more. Thank you very much, Malcolm. And, and I'd like to direct the, uh, the question now to Sam. Over to you, Sam. Uh, thanks, Al. Yeah, you know, for, for enablers, um, you know, I, I think, uh thinking about you know and this is now like i'm i'm going to go contradict everything i just said but but the government still has a role right and and i think you know making sure that we're paying enough attention to to the policy side of this um you know there's the government doesn't has a role not just in letting commercial flourish but also encouraging it incentivizing it i thought what Namrata said about about SpaceX really should be foot stomps, right? Like like that that is still like we're still not at the, the the situation in which this space economy is is flourishing in the absence of governments, right? Governments are still providing most of the money going into space, and, and so that that there is a, a real role for governments, including for the Asia Pacific. Um, you know, I, I think about just to take uh, a non space example, like autonomous cars, right? Like we, we've been talking about autonomous cars for a really long time, but it wasn't until DARPA created those, those, uh, those challenges that, that you actually like really saw the industry take off. So, so there, there's just a lot of partnership opportunities, I think, between um, commercial and the government uh, for space that are going to be necessary, um, especially if some of this big capital that has gone into space maybe dries up. Uh, which I don't think it will, but but you know we the situation is obviously evolving. Um, the, the other structural challenge I, I would mention just broadly is is thinking about for countries in the Asia Pacific, 
thinking about this relationship between United States and China, I, I think is going to be something that countries need to consider, right? Um, you know, there, there is some countries are in, in this region are really reliant uh, or have very close economic ties with China, uh, but may um, have security relationships with the United States. And, and I think this is, you know, you see this with the CHIPS Act passed in the United States. You know, there, there is something happening and it's going to be challenging, more and more challenging, I think, um, figuring out how to, how to maneuver uh, those relationships. Um, so, so that's something that I don't have a solution, uh, but I think it's something that countries really need to be strategic about. And it's going back to Malcolm's point about picking your friends uh, wisely, right? And then figuring out, you know, what, what, the, what, what, what you want for the long term uh, for your partnerships um, in this domain. Thanks very much, Sam. And and last but not least, let's let's have a view from commercial space. And and Ron, over to you. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? All right. I I can. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. My apologies. It looks like my camera has frozen up on me. Although uh, usually when this happens, I'm usually caught in some very unflattering pose. I'm glad that it caught me this time, at least in, in something passable there. So uh, I'm also glad because you weren't able. Uh, to see me uh, grimacing and squirming here as my colleagues talked about uh, ITAR and all of its massive impositions. We can only imagine that as the president of a US subsidiary of or of a foreign owned company with uh, a subsidiary ourselves in, in Israel and partners in the UK, uh, that it is something that I live and breathe every day. And uh, so I agree with all of the points that everybody has made in the interest of time. I think that instead of rehashing some of the same ground, I'll focus in on something that hasn't been mentioned yet, space, or sorry, supply chain robustness. And uh, sort of drawing on, on Sam's comment there earlier, um, not only is this uh, a, a, an, oppor an opportunity to shore up a critical uh, challenge that we have across the globe, but I think it also presents an opportunity for international collaboration. We talked earlier about uh, taxpayer dollars going back into uh, countries and geo return and countries investing in their own industry. And that's all well and good. But right now we have a situation where even in the US with the space industry as massive as it is that you have some critical components that are only made by one supplier or two suppliers. And if there's any hiccups, you know, somebody gets the flu or something, now all of a sudden your program is at risk uh, costs go up, schedules get pushed out. I really think that I just can't, I, I spent last week at the Aerospace Industry Association's uh, Board of Governors meeting in, in Santa Barbara, and this is a hot topic, something that a lot of my colleagues there spoke about, the, the importance and the necessity to really shore up our supply chain. And I think that uh, what, I, what, I, what I'm going to propose to a lot of my colleagues here in the U.S. is that we need to think more broadly about using the great capability that exists in our, our uh, uh, partner nations, our, our ally, uh, uh, treaty ally uh, partners around the world and tap into uh, the resources and the capabilities they have there. Somebody at the outset mentioned uh, Canada specializing in uh, robotic capabilities, right? From an economic standpoint, this makes a lot of sense, right? There's comparative advantage in other places where you can tap into an ally's capability to deliver that capability cheaper, which in the end is a win-win uh, kind of a phenomenon. So I, I think that that's one area that is a critical, currently an inhibitor because everybody's faced with supply chain challengers. And I think that if we do it right, not only can it be an enabler of space, but of better and more robust bilateral and multilateral collaboration with our allies. Thank you very much, Ron. And you know, I, I'd like actually to to pick up on that point that you just mentioned there about supply chains and uh, robustness uh, of those supply chains, because we do have a question in, from our audience here that that kind of speaks to to the robustness and resilience of the commercial sector uh, to disruptions coming uh, in 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 outer space. Um, uh, you know, whether these are natural phenomena or whether they are generated by accidents or by uh, practices such as uh, anti, anti ASAP testing and stuff like that. I mean, how, how, how will the 
how can the, the commercial sector stay resilient and robust? Uh, because the, these these sort of outliers, to some degree, disrupt the pattern, the norms associated with space, and uh, also disrupt uh, important norms around insurance uh, in space. Uh, Ron, do you want to take a stab at this, and then uh, perhaps somebody else would, on the panel would like to as well? Over. Sure. Uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Astroscale is an on-orbit servicing company focused on space sustainability. The company was actually founded uh, originally specifically to tackle the problem of, of space debris. And here, when I say space debris, I'm talking about large objects, defunct satellites and rocket bodies, not, not the small stuff. So I think there's a couple of different answers. There's the technology answer to that, where companies such as myself, uh, Astroscale and, and uh, similar companies around the globe are developing technologies and bringing them to market to address the problem, right? We have uh, right now a satellite on orbit that's demonstrating the ability to dock with satellites with a docking plate and bring them down at their end of life. We're launching a mission next year that's gonna inspect a rocket body from JAXA uh, to set up a follow-on mission to go and, and, and bring that rocket body down. So bringing technology to market is one aspect to it. But then we've also spoken about the importance of uh, ourselves as corporate citizens and other space uh, companies being good stewards of those resources and following um, standards of, of behaviors and, and, and norms of behavior that are out there and being part of that dialogue as a partner with governments around the world to help shape that policy in a way that achieves the dual objective of maintaining a space environment that's gonna be usable by future environments while at the same time ensuring that that policy regime is not so restrictive that it squashes innovation. Sam, you wanna you wanna jump on this too? Over. Yeah, thanks. I, I think this is a it's a really great question and a great issue. You know, it's one of the this idea of how to use commercial space systems. You know, in a crisis or conflict, is one of the real focus areas in, in U.S. Uh, in U.S. national security space circles, and I I moderated a, a panel on this a couple of weeks ago, and, and you know it touches on this subject, right? Like, how do you how does the U.S. government how should governments think about uh, protection of commercial space assets that might be used for military purposes, or how should U.S. government think about how should governments think about protection of commercial assets generally? Um, how should commercial space assets think about protecting themselves, right? And, and I think there's a lot of different ways. Um, that you could you could cut this question, but you know some of the the ideas that have been that are being thrown around are things like indemnification, things like sharing you know in a conflict, sharing threat information uh, from the government to commercial actors so that they can take measures to try to protect themselves. Um, th there's also things like you know the the commercial space actors might take different steps. They might ruggedize, right? Like they may change their operations. I mean, I think about. Uh, ships, you know, that merchant vessels after World War One or during World War One, right? Like they learned to ruggedize themselves in various ways. So so there's a lot of uh, ways to, to kind of pull at this question, including, you know, going back to to our or the earlier comments from, from General Morehouse, how is the U.S. Space Command thinking about defining, um, you know, this mission of its to protect the domain? Does that mean also protecting commercial actors that are being used for military purposes? Uh, does it mean U.S. commercial actors generally, right? Like these are all questions uh, that I think governments and commercial players are going to, to need to grapple with because, you know, space technology is inherently dual use, right? Like, and, and I think I, you hear a lot uh, about, oh, we need to kind of separate civilian and military space technology. It's like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because, you know, positioning, navigation, timing is really crucial to civilian life. It's also really important uh, for military forces. Um, satellite communications is obviously really important for civilian life, also really important for military forces. We use imagery for uh, detecting pests for farmers, right? But we also use it uh, for military purposes to, to identify, uh, you know, when Russia is building, is is compiling forces at the, the edge of Ukraine. So, so this you know, the, the dual use of, mil of of space technology is going, is, is really important 
aspect of it that's going to mean that it's always going to have military applications. So we need to think about these questions of protection and organization um, more than, than we're doing, than we have been in the past. Over. Thank you yeah, very I, much. I, yeah, I would add in, yeah, I would add in, we need to think about this at two levels. On the first hand, uh, we need to think about the growing reliance on, on large numbers of satellites, mega constellations in the LEO to GEO environment in the coming years for everything from uh, Internet of Things through to broadband in the sky, through to pervasive Earth, Earth observation and all the impacts that has on the evolving uh, way societies and economies work. So if we start to have incidents uh, of, of uh, either use of ASATs or space debris or, or solar flare events, then we have to have a way to sustain our space infrastructure in that region because otherwise our economies and our political systems and our societies start to fall apart very quickly. And that could generate insecurity and instability that could then lead to conflict. Um, I think the second level of thinking about this is, is in perhaps in the next 20 to 30 years is as we extend our presence out to cislunar space and we start to do economic activity around the moon and on the moon and including space resource utilization, space manufacturing and so forth, we add a whole new dimension and level to how we need to protect things out there. And when you look at, and I, th I know Namrata has written about this, which read rather well, if when you look at how the Chinese think about the moon, um, you know, they think about the moon very much in astroeconomic terms. Uh, whereas we think about it um, in purely in terms of science, technology, stepping stone to Mars and so forth. So we're going to have to start thinking about um, how we protect infrastructure, including satellites, including lunar bases, including access, all the way out to cislunar space in the next 20 to 30 years. And that's a much bigger task than even thinking about uh, the challenges of ASATs and uh, space debris in the LEO to GEO environment. So we've got our work cut out for us. And I think um, part of the solution, I think, probably is some sort of collaborative approach um, to monitoring space situational awareness, space domain awareness, all the way out to cislunar space. I've just been reading, for example, the new national cislunar science and technology strategy, and that talks about that. So I think that we're heading in the right direction, but the, the task in front of us is quite massive. Uh, it, it dwarfs even the technical aspects of getting out to the moon is just how do we manage a space economy that, that extends not just in the Leo to Geo environment, but all the way out to cislunar space. Thank you, Malcolm. And, you know, yeah. mentioning Namrata, Namrata, before you, you can comment on this question here too, but I wanted to put to you, Namrata, a question that came through, um, came from our audience. And, uh, you know, this, this kind of draws attention to, to the fact that um, the new space economy relies to a great degree on startups and smaller companies. Um, uh, you know, kind of a, a very kind of innovative sort of culture here where not, not all contributors necessarily subscribe to very high standards of security of information and things like that. And, and you know, what might happen consequently is uh, keeping in mind the dual use nature of many space innovations what might happen if some of these space innovations might fall into the wrong hands, criminal hands, for example? Um, do we need to, to take into account these risks to international security when we, when we push forward uh, in this manner with our efforts at space innovation? And, and uh, as well, could you comment on some of the things that uh, have just been discussed? Over to you, Namrata. Yeah, sure. So I think, uh, well, so I also just finished reading the White House Lunar Strategy. I think what is interesting to see is that in that particular strategy, uh, the U.S. finally, Malcolm, seems to be awakening to the fact that the moon is could be for economic development, right? But it's not as forceful as the Chinese concept on the moon, right? It's still a little bit of reticence, but at least they talk about economic development about 10 times in the document. So I literally counted how many times they did it. So I think in that context, uh, what becomes clear is that the Biden administration is pushing for commercial partnership to develop cislunar space domain awareness, 
uh, economic development, reusable lunar, uh, refuelable, sorry, uh, lunar lander, as well as a launch structure that is not expendable and expensive like the space launch system, right? Which is $4 billion of launch, $94 billion for the Artemis program, if we continue with this particular structure. So uh, having said that, I think uh, coming to the discussion in terms of commercial space and what they are interested in and uh, what could go wrong. So uh, I think when I talk to the commercial space sector, not just in the US, but also some of the conversations in China and then in India, I think one thing the commercial space sector is very much interested in is to have access to space that is not destroyed or, or access is denied because of space debris. Right, there is a big concern about that. Also, because there are these push for national level satellite constellations, because SpaceX wants to build this huge constellation with 40,000 satellites. China has a national constellation that they want to build. Uh, Chinese space startups want to build a, a 5G 142 satellite constellation. So that num that's number one concern. Now, the the second uh, critical concern is in regard to lack of regulation. For example, when you go beyond low earth orbit to cislunar space, right? So there is exact no regulation basically in terms of how would you deal with a situation where you have one particular country determining or extending their presence in the South Pole of the moon and a private company wanting to go there and that particular landing is denied. So that's a big concern for those companies investing in lunar resources or lunar extraction capability. So that's a concern coming out of the commercial sector. In fact, what is so interesting is that we just, I think one thing that we also need to recognize is that many of the state-based funding and regulations have happened because of the push from the commercial sector. So the very fact that the US had a US Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act of 2015 that gave American citizens and companies the right to extract resources and keep it, it is because of the lobbying of companies like planetary resources, right? That push for it and wanted such regulatory framework. And so finally to your question about what could go wrong. I mean, it is very true that space technology is dual use and uh, space startups sometimes because of a lack of understanding of that implication. Also, I have noticed that it's also because of a lack of an ability to have a good legal team that explains to them the implications. Or if you think about the environments we are in, even as academics, policymakers, and entrepreneurs, right? And uh, Ron can actually, uh, maybe he can relate to this. I have been to conversations, for example, in California, where you have a lot of the space startups, or in uh, conferences that are mostly about entrepreneurial space development, where there is a lack of understanding of the national security implications of space, not because of lack of uh, trying, but because that's not their focus. The focus is to develop the technology, right? And so because the focus is to develop the technology, then there is this push for international collaboration without realizing sometimes that that international collaboration might be that if you collaborate with a private Chinese space company, that is completely directed and funded by the Chinese military, that things can go wrong, right? And it's not because there is, uh, there is because there is a lack of understanding of another country's structure and how the particular country's space ecosystem may be actually conceptualized and who is actually leading it and who is directing it. The final point I'll make is that there is this bigger concern I have that we tend to mirror image, right? Because we live in an open, democratic, innovative system where lines of leadership, ownership is clear, we assume another country might have the exact same mechanism, right? And that's why there is also this final lead of understanding how another country is configured as well, especially those countries that are not led by democratic systems. So I think I'll end there. And if Ron has something to add, I would be delighted to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Namrata. Uh, Ron, uh, for, for maybe a minute or two, over. Yeah, I think you hit it right on the head. I mean, it's, it's a concern. I don't know that there's any solution to it, but um, I think uh, Malcolm addressed it in, in his comments uh, earlier about how we can, space has always served uh, national security purposes from the beginning, from the inception, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's just a matter of companies being aware and tapping into the resources that they have to make sure that they steer clear of uh, any potential pitfalls. Like Malcolm said, right, ITAR is a huge uh, issue. 
but it serves a useful purpose, right? And so it's just a matter of ensuring that those regulations are not just encumbering, but enabling industry as well. I thought maybe a, a good way to bring the discussion to a close would be to, to invite our panelists to maybe take a look into the future and, and um, for them to provide some comments on how, how they see the prospects for space innovation in the Indo-Pacific. Now, you know, I, I think all of us that joined this webinar today are of an, of an optimistic inclination. We wish well for the Asia Pacific uh, in the future. But I was just wondering if I were to push you panelists uh, if you were to name a breakthrough, a breakout innovation of the future in the a Asia Pacific, where do you think that might be in the Asia Pacific? And why do you think that? And if you could spend maybe a couple of minutes for each panelist, uh, I'll, be, I'll be really interested to hear your views about the future. I I'm gonna push this to Malcolm first. He's thinking very, very hard. Um, well, look, uh, I think that the, the pull comes from the moon in the sense that we're talking as Artemis 1 is orbiting in distant retrograde orbit around the moon. It's laying the basis for uh, further missions. I don't think Artemis, as it's currently configured, is, is the right way to go. It's not a sustainable approach, given you know, Namrata quite correctly said $4 billion a launch for a SLS, one, one launch per year if we're lucky. That's not a sustainable basis. But I think whilst we all applauded the success of the of Artemis One launch, what we're all waiting for is Starship Super Heavy to launch, which is at $10 million a launch and probably once a month, if not quicker than that. So I think that the potential, I think the breakthrough happens if um, the lunar frontier opens up in 10, 20 years' time. We have a permanent human presence on the moon doing space resource utilization science and technology, uh, you know, sort of a space-based industry, uh, an astro-economic sphere that is emerging around the moon, comprising all the major space powers. Suddenly you get an incentive for all these Indo-Pacific states to want to be a part of that. Australia is, is exactly the same. That's why the Australian Space Agency has the Moon to Mars initiative, because we want to be part of that future. And I remember as a young boy, uh, um, I watched Apollo 11, on the TV in, in Adelaide in black and white. Um, and then, uh, and I thought that was interesting. But then a couple of years later, I went to see 2001 Space Odyssey at the cinema. And I thought, that's the future I want. I want to be part of that where I can go to the moon whenever I want. I think we're finally catching up to 2001 and we're, I think within 20 years, we'll have that future. And I think if we have that future whereby commercial space can actually open up that real high frontier and actually enable us to exploit the moon and the cislunar environment, a lot of states in the Indo-Pacific region are gonna to wanna to jump on board that. And that's where you're gonna get the innovation. You're gonna get that pull from the moon for states here on earth to say, we need to be part of that, not just states, but also commercial actors. So you get new commercial companies appearing in the Indo-Pacific region that need to be part of that, that new, new frontier of, of human economic activity and human civilization. And of course, the moon is, is, is one step along the, the pathway to the Mar to Mars and also going further out. But I think personally, the moon is far more important than Mars because it's the, it's the moon that gives us that permanent presence in space, that gives us that space-based economy, not Mars. Uh, so that's, that's where I would see it. I think the moon is the starting point. Great, thank you very much, Malcolm. And, and Sam, this, you love this question, Sam. So come on, let, let's hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, I, uh, I, I appreciate the question. I'm gonna answer it in much more mundane terms uh, than Malcolm, stay within the earth. Um, I, I, I may be biased uh, because I, I was just there and I ate so much delicious kimchi, but I have a hard time thinking of a country that is poised for a greater leap in space than South Korea. Um, you know, this is a, a country that was a relative newcomer um, to space and it still has a very small number uh, of satellites on orbit, but there's just all these different, I think, factors coming in um, that are all really promising for, for South Korea. Um, I, as I mentioned, this is, was a, a crucial year, right? They, they launched their uh, domestic rocket, domestically built rocket for the first time. They also launched uh, their rover for for Mars. Um, as I mentioned, they have really ambitious plans 
uh, for for their commercial. They're aggressively pursuing commercialization. Um, they're also they have really really ambitious plans for their national space program, including developing their own positioning, navigation, timing satellites. If they are to develop, they are developing that. They will be one of this very small select group of countries that has its own PNT systems, uh, India, China, Russia, the United States, um, and then the, the European um, uh, Galileo program. So a, a small, small group. Um, and, and, and there's, you know, some of the commercial uh, ventures, Hanwha has plans to put up 2000 satellites into orbit for uh, a, a LEO satcom system. They're, they're a country that's extremely technologically advanced, and they're also a country that is is wealthy. And this is, Al, I'm getting into to stuff that you know better than I do, but they're a wealthy country that is, even given its size, is growing at a pretty high rate compared to other wealthy countries. So, um, you know, this year we're probably going to see um, some, some changes within their national space program. They're rethinking, the country's rethinking their governance uh, for how they make decisions um, and how kind of the civilian military uh, research gets split. But I think it's a really exciting time for, for South Korea and I'm excited to see what they do next. Great, thanks so much, Sam. I, I, I knew that, you know, that, that the, the food would have got to you and... Uh... <laughs> I'm a simple man, thoughts. I'm a simple man. So <laughs> Kim Chi does it. <laughs> I'd like to I'd like to hand this over now to to Ron. Ron, where 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 do you think things are going to be happening? Over. Yeah, um, I agree with Sam. Right, a lot of great technology and innovation coming out of Korea. Clearly, a lot coming out of Japan as well. There's Astroscale, iSpace, Kitai, which I mentioned earlier, among uh, others. Um, and uh, we have a lot of relationships and engagement throughout the entire region. So that's. Um, I, I think it's going to continue to grow. In terms of the market segment, answering the question from the market segment for, uh, uh, perspective, I, I don't disagree with what Malcolm said earlier, but I think that there are some interim steps between where we are now and where we are 20 years in the future where you know the, the moon is colonized and getting to the moon is, is routine. And I think that that's space sustainability enabled through on-orbit services. I really believe that on-orbit servicing, offering services to other satellites to help extend their life, be more sustainable, be reusable, right? Why, why are we going to bring debris down and let it burn up in the atmosphere when in the future we can take apart satellites, use those um, precious metals on them so that we can do manufacturing in orbit, manufacturing on the moon, those kinds of services, uh, rendezvous proximity operations, the robotics that goes into docking that allows us to move things into different orbits, move them out to cislunar orbit, refuel and reuse satellites. I really think that that's going to underpin the growth of this trillion dollar space economy that we often hear uh, spoken about. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. And, and last but not least, uh, Mara, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, sure, sure, Al. So what are those breakthrough technologies that might change the game and where is it happening and why? So I think one breakthrough technology is space biology and so reproduction in space, which uh, China has showcased us in 2016 through their mouse embryo, mice embryo. They were the first country to do that, where some of the embryos actually developed and they've given you the images. And then recently they announced a project in on the Tiangong Space Station that is China is building as we speak, the Chinese Permanent Space Station, where they're going to conduct a reproductive experiment on monkeys on in low Earth orbit. And the lead designer of that particular program says that this is towards some of the concepts that China is putting up, permanent settlement on the moon and Mars. So that I think will be a game changer, reproductive biological capability and to showcase it. That hasn't been done before. The second technology where I think things will completely change is if China is able to demonstrate a kilowatt level power beaming as they want to do by 2028 with space-based solar power. If they are able to do that, that is going to change the world because of the revolutionary impact of that capability, right? In terms of accessible to renewable technology 24 hours. I think the second game changer is Japan's recent announcement that they want to create spaceports like airports, where you build an entire ecosystem of space tourism, space passengers actually enjoying 
access to space and having facilities, not just going to a beach and looking at a rocket going off, but an entire ecosystem and infrastructure, right? So they want to turn Japan into a space hub. They call it the space hub for Asia Pacific. And that's a model that's interestingly, a country in the Middle East like United Arab Emirates is also adopting uh, in terms of building the UAE into the Middle Eastern hub for such a capability, right? So innovation is, when I first started, I said innovation is not just about technology, it's about narratives, it's about policy, it's about regulation. And finally, I think the game changer would be if India succeeds recently, India, so the Indian Minister for Space uh, responded to a question in parliament as to why was India at all investing in a human uh, space program to lower Earth orbit when you have other things to do like poverty alleviation. So he argued that India's space, uh, human space program is about space tourism. So if India succeeds, uh, you might see a future where the cost of a ticket, which is $52 million today, believe me, it's that much, is going to come down because the access to space will be based on reusable rockets, which India hopes to clinch by 2025. And the cost of manufacturing of those rockets is going to be even more cheaper than you have in the United States. And that's going to be a breakthrough. And so I think those are the technologies we need to look for. Thank you so much, Namrata. I knew I could always count on you for a more optimistic way of finishing this webinar. And I, I wasn't wrong. I don't know how about how you feel, ladies and gentlemen, and the audience in particular, but every time I'm assembled with uh, these very good folks here on this panel, I, I always walk away much, much smarter about space because they, they offer such deep and penetrating insights and, and the diversity of perspective that is offered by, by all these very, very smart people is just incredible. I never believe, I say it again, I never believe I'll learn about heavy metal in Mongolia, but I did so today. Quite apart from that, I picked up so much knowledge from everything else that was offered by these panelists. I, I hope you will join me in virtually offering your thanks to these panelists for their time and their, their expertise. Uh, we deeply value it and we look forward to staying in touch with them on future occasions and perhaps future events as well too, looking into this. For those of you in the audience that very generously gave up your time, and, and especially those that contributed questions to the uh, um, to the Q and A test Q and A box, uh, and I did not get to your question, I, I I must apologize profusely. Time is of the essence. We try to get to as many questions as possible, and I've also taken the liberty of crunching questions together to make sure that we we try to get as many as we can. But if I fail to do that, I, uh, that's entirely on me, and I apologize for that. But I do hope that you will continue to join us in future events that we hold on space. And with that, uh, Christy, do I hold, hand it back to you to introduce uh, our closing comments? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Al, and thank you for your wonderful moderation. As always, you do such a great job integrating points, working in audience questions, and overall making it a very fun and engaging conversation. So we thank you so much. So to deliver our closing remarks, I'd now like to turn the floor over to Dr. Crystal Pryor, who is Vice President at Pacific Forum, and again, has been a close collaborator in organizing these outer space related events over the last three years. Um, Dr. Pryor, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christy. Aloha, today we've been joined by participants from across the Asia Pacific, and we've heard remarks from space experts spanning research, industry, and government. This emerging space landscape demands new ways of thinking. Today's APR SAF side event, Bridging Space Innovation Opportunities, Perspectives on Asia Pacific Experiences, was convened on the premise of the value of dialogue among advanced and emerging Asia Pacific space nations, including Japan, South Korea, India, China, and Mongolia. This aligns with the vision of the Asia Pacific Regional Space Agency Forum and complements its initiatives through discussions on the current state of space innovation across the region, and more crucially, how to develop relationships, institutions, and regulatory frameworks to facilitate collaborative space innovation across sectors and across players. As in the two previous iterations of this site event, not only do we seek to promote APRSF's core interests, we also endeavor to build bridges across the Asia Pacific through a multi-stakeholder approach. 
Doing so is particularly important given the prospect that reaching global consensus on space cooperation remains a great challenge, as was mentioned several times today. Today's virtual site event has sought to integrate state and commercial, civil and military endeavors in space, space sectors at the national, regional, and international levels, and public-private ventures to help lay the groundwork for regulatory and institutional developments. <clears throat> As in our previous meetings, the vision behind today's event was to harness participation on alternative pathways for space cooperation grounded in both concept and practice. Moving forward, we'll continue to seek dynamic, transparent, and inclusive participation, especially from developing countries and from the private sector, existing spacefaring nations and emerging ones, both established companies and startups, all pushing the boundaries of space technology and its many applications. We aim to help close the gap between government and regulatory bodies and the space industry to assist in formulating incentive mechanisms that will spark more innovation while remaining committed to bridging space innovation opportunities. Once again, many thanks to our esteemed keynote speaker, our panelists and our guests for joining us today and to the University of Hawaii at Manoa Center for Indo-Pacific Affairs and the Daniel K. Inoue Asia Pacific Center for Security Studies for their partnership in this event. We look forward to staying in touch until our next APR staff side event. Thank you. <laughs>